Blog Talk Radio. What's up, college football fans, and Happy New Year. Welcome to another edition of Quick Slants, the show where we talk nothing but college football. I'm one of your hosts. I'm Dev McMillan, but I'm here with the star of the show. We got Freddie Purdue in the building. Fred, what's going on? Happy New Year, sir. What's going on, man? College football has really, man, it, it ratcheted up really, really quickly, and we were treated to some some surprises. We got a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the bowl season is plugging right along. Uh, we got <laughs> we got a national championship matchup. Uh, surprise, surprise. We meet again. Have a whole show on that match, you know, before that matchup actually goes down. But we'll briefly talk about it in this episode as well. But let's get into the rundown real quick, Fred, because there's a few things that happen in college football that we want to talk about before we preview these remaining bowl games. Um, so first, uh, Ole Miss hires Rich Rodriguez as offensive coordinator. Did you see this coming? No, I didn't. Uh... This is crazy because when you look at the SEC, uh, you look at, at Ole Miss, you see how their offense wasn't terrible, but the defense was a lot of gave a lot of gave them a lot of the problems. And I think right now recruiting is going to be a huge thing for them. Matt Luke and his group are really they, they haven't felt the uh, they haven't felt a lot of the issues that'll come with lack of depth yet. They're they've always been roughly an eight win team, so they aren't competing for titles or anything, but you can see if their front line guys go down, you can see where the depth comes in a little, but now it's really going to get really imperative that they bring in a guy that can run a like run an offense smoothly. Uh, the Hugh Freeze era is completely over now, and he's got his guys going. He's not a terrible coach. Uh, Rich Rodriguez will be a very nice upgrade to the running game. I don't know how much he'll be able to help the passing game. Uh, when you look, think of Rich Rodriguez, I think back to the days of West Virginia, uh, which we have breaking news out of West Virginia. Um, but, you know, when I think of Rich Rodriguez, um, I think of Pat White, Steve Slayton, Noel Devine, those days where they were just running the, the then Big East uh, I don't really – his days at Arizona weren't all that great. Uh, but I, his days at West Virginia were amazing, and he can run a high-powered offense. Okay, you said the uh, breaking news out of West Virginia? Yeah, we got breaking news out of West Virginia. I saw a little bit yesterday. <laughs> exactly. Uh, West Virginia head coach Dana, Dana Hogerson is actually leaving West, West Virginia to – uh, become the Houston head coach. This one boggled my mind when I saw the rumor, and then it became a very real. Uh, apparently, they're giving him a uh, five-year, $20 million deal uh, to leave West Virginia. And he's from – he's really one of those Houston kind of guys. He loves that Texas area. Uh, he was there with uh, at Oklahoma State. Uh, years ago, and then he also was at Houston with uh, when he was there with Kevin Sumlin. When when he was there, he coached up Case Keenum, so he's had very big um, big roots down there. And he's going to be able to leave the Big Twelve. And yeah, you're leaving the Big Twelve, but I think that's going to you won't be able to compete for championships. But when has West Virginia really competed for a championship on average over right. the last? Three, four years, they've averaged about seven wins a season. Uh, I have 20 million reasons why he should leave. Uh, he was only going to be making about $2.5 million, so that's a nice upgrade for him. Uh, he wasn't in danger of being fired at West Virginia. Uh, he didn't have a successor, really, for Will Greer. So, at Houston, you can, you can go get four- and five-star recruits on a regular basis, you, it's been proven with, with guys like Ed Oliver coming around. It's keeping those guys in, in-house. And quite honestly, I think with Houston at some point, they may just join the Big 12 anyway. Uh, seeing and I, I never understood the move for West Virginia to, to leave uh, and go to the Big 12 outside of maybe trying to get into a championship scenario, which 
after what we saw over the weekend, they have no chance of doing that. All right, well, I've got a couple of names here to go to the NFL draft, the first of which is Duke quarterback Daniel Jones. He declares for the NFL draft. Thoughts? Daniel Jones, not a great arm, but a good arm, uh, decent accuracy, but he struggled a lot this year. Uh, he's going to, for me, I, I thought at the beginning of the year, uh, he would be, he could possibly be a sleeper first round pick, but I think he'll probably fall to the second round. But then again, we know how that kind of thing goes. Um, quarterbacks get pushed up for whatever reason, just simply for the fact that we're, the NFL is a quarterback league. Uh, I think he's going to be a, he'll test well as far as, uh, on the board, he'll test well. Simply put, he has David Cutcliffe in his back corner, in his corner, uh, tutoring him in the court as, as far as being a quarterback. He has the best of the best. He's the same guy that helped Eli Manning, the same guy that helped Peyton Manning. Uh, you you can't come out of Duke and not know anything. Uh, you went to Duke. You have to be a smart guy to do that. And Duke has been pretty good over the last year or so. So uh, interested to see how he stacks up. But mm, early prediction. Maybe second, second round. Okay. Uh, someone else who declared for the draft, Florida defensive lineman Ja'Kai Polite. Um, he's, he's placed his name into the hat as well. Ja'Kai Polite, one of my favorites this year. He has one of the quickest first steps in, in the country. He is going to be a complete problem for everyone when it comes to the NFL. Uh, he He's one of the special ones. He has that special to him. Uh, he's going to be a – he's going to come off the board pretty early in a very defensive line heavy draft. All right. You kind of polite, scaring NFL offenses everywhere. Get in the – from your beloved. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Crazy as always, <laughs> Mark Rick retires. <laughs> Former defensive coordinator Manny Diaz, who back on, I think about December 13th, took the head coaching job at Temple, got the call from the U, and, and, and immediately, and, you know, jumped up and said F Temple. <laughs> Went back home to the U, so uh, leaving Temple behind. Like, what are your thoughts on this situation? Being, especially being a fan of the U, do you think? a good hire? I Okay, so let's first, to answer that question, yes. That's a very good hire. It, help, it saves the recruiting class. But this thing happened in such a crazy, crazy day. Actually, a crazy weekend. So if, let's just say you decided I'm going to go and enjoy my New Year's and I'm going to just go unplugged for the weekend. Let's just, just understand when you come back and, on Monday – and, and you saw this, you said, oh, my God, what happened? Hmm. <laughs> because it went from, you know, the bowl game on last Thursday where th- it, it was 35-3. to three. And, by the way, I predicted that when I said 14-point loss, not I, – I didn't think it would be, a, you know, a 20 – or, I'm sorry, a 32-point loss, but a 14-point loss. I gave a little bit more credit than that. But when after that loss, you know, and actually before that, you know, you had Blake James, the AD, saying, look, we're going to have to have a sit-down about this offense because Miami has a defense, and they've wasted it over the last couple of years, but we need an offense to complement that defense. And he, Mark Rick would have to put his pride to the side, go get him a real – go get him a quarterback coach. Who is, the quarterback coach was his son, John Wright, who was with him at Georgia too. Or, I'm sorry, John Rick, who was at, um, who was at Georgia with him. As well as you need need an offensive coordinator, he's the we have an off Miami has an offensive coordinator in Thomas Brown, who was a former running back at Georgia, but he's the offensive coordinator in title only. Mark Rick calls plays, so you need to do those two things. Well, the, that was the struggle of Miami all season. After the bowl game, Dave Epstein, a uh, a person on the on the committee, the trustee committee actually tweeted out his displeasure with the Miami program. Blake James tweeted out his frustrated frustration with the, um, with the Miami program as far as the offense is concerned and that they would be addressed. I wake up, I wake up and see, you know, 
on Sunday, I say, okay, I'm going to watch some, watch my Patriots do everything all they they need to do and all the craziness that is Week 17. And as I'm t- flipping the NFL games on, I see on my phone, Mark Rick has retired, and I'm like, yes, but no, <laughs> because you know you you're in the middle of a recruiting cycle. Not you just had all these kids signing on early signing period. So uh oh. And Manny Diaz is gone, so why didn't you say, you know, I'm just go put this guy's head coach in waiting. Then, you know, fix this situation. Nah, instead of waiting until he's gone. Well, the situation right. it is what it is. They're looking for candidates. I mean, names of candidates were coming from everywhere. Everywhere from Rex Ryan who actually said he had interest in the program to which that was I'm I'm thankful that didn't happen. Uh, I've heard everything from Mario Cristobal at Oregon, who is a former player, Butch Davis, who who, who was the, the the orchestrator of the early 2000s Miami teams, where those teams were just dominant. Um, I've heard everything from um, Harbaugh to Kiffin to I mean I've heard a lot of crazy scenarios and it, the things that just did not make any sense uh, whatsoever. So. Then, but it was actually reported that Manny Diaz was actually still on campus, and he had come back down to campus about an hour before the the announcement. He was spotted on campus, and an hour after, all the statements and press conferences were about the national. <laughs> Manny was like, "Hold up, let me stick around just in case." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he yeah. So, and it was actually quoted by the Temple AD during the. Uh, during the press conference when, when Manny Diaz was actually introduced at Temple that, you know, you we're happy to have him, but we know his his dream job is at the University of Miami. And if that dream job ever came open, that they would embrace him going back. Now, you these are things you don't do in business. I mean, this is still a business, right? You, you don't. You just don't say, oh, our top guy is going to go somewhere else. Well, we're, we're it backfired more on your ass that it opened up <laughs> right away. <laughs> Exactly. And I think they they have and see they're getting compensated on both ends because Jeff Collins, their head coach, went to Georgia Tech. They got two and a half million dollars from that. And then Miami also paid four million dollars to Temple for that. So we got six and a half million dollars after losing two coaches. Uh so that that's a that's a little bit of an incentive, but and we've already so, as far as that's go ahead. So here's my question to you, because you mentioned when you were telling the story you mentioned, you know, oh, why did this happen after Manny Diaz had already gone? <clears throat> Excuse me. So if, you know, if we knew there was like a next up situation and they were going to hire from within, it it had to be Manny Diaz? Um, not necessarily. I think no. okay. I think not not necessarily because in reality Mark Ricks had just signed a an extension going into the season. So he was on he was actually still on contract for a while. But I think in a situation where you're putting you're be having your feet put to the fire and I said it all season, I said Mark Rick does not want to put he he would rather his pride is on the line because now you're calling out his coaching ability because he's the guy calling the plays. He buys the groceries, he he fixes the meals. So he can't do that anymore, and he has to give that up. That's a problem for him. He would rather retire and say, I, I'd rather not give up play calling duties. I'd rather not fire my son, and I'd rather not evolve because you have to evolve. Even Nick Saban, who ran a old, old school tight end with a fullback, we're just going to run the ball down your throat constantly. We're not throwing the ball. We're not even putting in an emphasis on quarterback. Even he had to go to the spread offense where you have guys like Tua, you have guys like Jalen Hurts, Calvin Ridley, uh, you have the explosive guys. Uh, you have to do that. He had to do that. And even on the defensive side, he had to do that as well where he went from really big nose tackles, the Vince Wilfork types. He had to go from that to the Aaron Donald types where, you know, and I'm just using, you know, player compared, not saying he has any of those players, but just type of player, you know, leaner, faster, stronger defensive lineman who can handle playing playing 90 snaps a game 
after losing to Johnny Manziel, Cam Newton, Deshaun Watson, he's had to constantly evolve. So if you, if the man at the top has to evolve, you have to evolve too. And I think that's so, where um, all of this is coming from. So the reason I ask that, like, you know, if it's known, like, okay, if for any chance that uh, Mark Rick ever is gone and we were going to, you know, look from within, I was wondering if he was the guy. The, the reason I ask that is because the, listening to you talk about the program over the last season, you know, we we know he didn't get fired and he probably wasn't going to get fired. Like you said, it was kind of an ultimatum of do this mm-hmm. to your staff or we're going to have to talk about something. But the way that the U had been performing, I never mm-hmm. really got the idea that his job wasn't at least on a little bit of, of shaky ground. So I was, you know, I'm just wondering why didn't Manny Diaz maybe wait until – some of this off-season stuff started to shake out. But then on the other hand, I kind of understand. Like, first of all, there's a head coaching job with your name on it. You know, you don't want to mm-hmm. spurn opportunities. And then also at the same time, you want to get in, um, you know, on the ground floor with the recruiting efforts. So, you know, right. I, I kind of understand, but I kind of could answer my own question. But I was wondering why he would bolt when the situation didn't seem 100% solid um, and, you know, he possibly could have just gotten a job without leaving and having the spurn temple. But, I, 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 like I said, I kind of get it. You know, you got recruiting season and all that stuff. I, for me, I think – I don't think anyone really knew. I mean, for me, Blake right. James actually kind of, <clears throat> it actually came out after the fact that, you know, it, it actually – everything came full circle for him where, you know, he was saying he was walking into – into church on, on into mass on Sunday. I'm sorry, on Saturday three years ago when Mark Rick was uh, fired at Georgia, and then uh, this past Saturday uh, he literally was walking out of mass, and he Mark Rick uh, he got an alert from Mark Rick saying, "Look, we need to talk," and that's when it came out to him. So I don't think anyone really knew. <clears throat> Manny Diaz was already under. He was already with Temple for 17 days. So he's already, he had to do what he had to do, but Manny Diaz was still back in Miami trying to build his coaching staff still. So that's going to be – that was huge. Um, and there were so many reports of, like, a split locker room where, you know, this thing, like, it, it went from bad to really bad, you know, internally. And when it's never good when after a really bad loss like that, and which was the second worst bowl loss in school history. The first one was LSU versus LSU back when uh, Jamarcus Russell was playing, some guy named Matt mm-hmm. Flynn stepped in for Jamarcus Russell and dropped 40 points on Miami. Yeah, that's a long time ago. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, two buses. split locker room. With, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you had a split locker room. The defense was just – they're balling all year long. I mean, Miami had the top five defense where – I saw a stat yesterday. Miami was among the elites of when it comes to yards per play allowed. They allow 4.6 yards per play. That's up there with Clemson, Alabama, uh, Michigan, where they're allowing like 4.2, 4.3, as much, as much as 4.5. So if you're right there with the elites, but then the offense on the other side, there were 73 quarterbacks among college football's 130 teams that individually threw for more yards than all three Miami starting quarterbacks. That's not wow. good. So no. and you have guys like Jeff Thomas leaving. Yeah, you, you have too many issues here. And you live in South Florida. Every analyst across the country I've seen is saying, if you live in South – if your team's in South Florida, why are you not running a spread offense? Where you're mo- – where you're, I mean, Saban's doing it. If Saban's doing it, he's hard-headed as anyone. Why aren't you doing this? So Manny Diaz has officially cleaned house on the offensive side. Everyone is gone already. He's already looking at guys like Larry Dora. <laughs> Manny came in like, I'll do what you want. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And see, I think with staff. him, because, because you had so much talent on defense and you wasted a good defense for three years, I think he know he, he felt that. because. And I said earlier in the year, I, said, I predicted about halfway through, 
Manny Diaz was going to leave because of his frustration. It wasn't that he wanted a head coaching job so much. I think he may have been okay staying because Mark Rick was 60 years old. He's not going to be there forever. So, you know, with knowing the type of person he is, he's the family man, Christian man, wants to, you know, he wants to enjoy life with his family. At some point, maybe in the next four to five years, he was going to retire anyway. So Manny Diaz had the keys to the car if he wanted to stay to answer your previous question. So, but when you, why would you, which would you rather be frustrated knowing every year the best that that you can produce is never going to be more than seven and five, eight and four, because the other side of the guy on the other side of the ball can't coach anyone up despite talent. Or would you rather go and go make a name for yourself and come back at some point? That's the kind of situation he's in. So, it worked out in the end, but for about 24 hours. I, well, actually, for about maybe, maybe I don't know, 12 hours, the Miami fans were shaking, really. All right, well, let's get into a little bit of bowl talk. Uh, first of all, Georgia cornerback DeAndre Baker is skipping today's Sugar Bowl versus Texas. I mean, we've seen this lately. Um, in recent years, this is nothing out of the norm when you're an NFL prospect. Uh, you want to skip these bowl games so you don't get hurt, blah, blah, blah. Uh, what's your thoughts on it? Well, I think this is one of the typical things. He's the number two cornerback available in, in this year's draft. He's not the, uh, as far as prospects are concerned, he's not the fastest, he's not the biggest, but he's um, he's that guy that's so consistent play to play to play that he it kind of, his talent kind of, it kind of um, cancels out where he's not the biggest, strongest, fastest. He's, I actually like him a little bit more than Greedy Williams, and I like Greedy Williams a lot, uh, who's at, at LSU. He's going to make a team super, super happy. All right. Um, the the semifinal, the college football playoff semifinal games, um, Notre Dame basically embarrassed the process <laughs> by getting <laughs> shellacked by Clemson 30-3. to uh, what were your thoughts on that shellacking? Clemson struggled early, but it's it's so obvious, even without Dexter Lawrence, that this team on defense still can get after your quarterback. Uh, they can still run the football. And Trevor Lawrence, young freshman, young freshman, you have a very, very bright future. I want to see it one more year where teams have a whole off season to look at your film. But young Trevor Lawrence, I'm not, I'm not trying to – pull a Mel Kiper way too early to tell, but Trevor Lawrence might be the number one overall pick in about two years. Just saying. Okay. Um, and going over, excuse me, to the other side, uh, Alabama kind of, we'll, we'll call it outlasts Oklahoma after dominating Oklahoma in the first half. They hold on to win that game 45-34 in the battle of you know, the top two Heisman candidates and the Heisman winner, of course, and Kyler Murray. Uh, what were your thoughts on that one? Kyler Murray, go play baseball. That's mm, the best yes, defense sir. you'll see in, in, in college football. It's the closest thing you'll see to an NFL defense. Kyler Murray, you had moments, but that defense got after him early and often. I mean, Hollywood Brown, Marquise Hollywood Brown, he was hurt. You could tell. He was he was kind of just out there trying to he was a decoy for the first maybe the first quarter. He felt good until he got hit. Um Josh Jacobs, the Alabama running back, you could tell he got in a rhythm. Usually Alabama goes with the hot guy because they have so many running backs. So uh he 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 shook a guy, broke his ankles really, really bad early and then to seal the deal about what third quarter, he trucked the guy so bad he hurt his leg. I'm like, how do you get trucked in the chest and you know you walk off with a leg injury? Uh, there were memes <laughs> going around saying this is what nerve Alabama damage. Was. <laughs> <laughs> there was a meme going around saying uh, with Josh Jacobs trucking this young man saying um, they showed a picture of Alabama's weight room. This is what Alabama's weight room looks like. And then him getting trucked. This is what Alabama's weight room feels like. And I felt that. I felt him getting trucked. And quite honestly, Tua looked good. Uh, Irv Smith looked good at tight end defense. I mean, Quentin Williams. So if you didn't, if you didn't know who he was before this game, you know who he is now. He's gonna be. He's a. He's just. He's a beast. Uh, 
this this game was, I mean, for, for the first half, I thought this game was going to, I'm like, oh, this game is going to be a blowout. Uh, I knew it would be a four, at least 14, but I didn't think, I figured at least Kyler Murray could pull some craziness and just, you know, do some kind of, pull some kind of magic. And Oklahoma figured it out on defense, but the mistakes, the penalties, just too uh, late. not having Marquise. Yeah, you can't pull yourself out of a 21-point hole <clears throat> after the first quarter, you know, against this defense, against this offense. So, uh, Alabama didn't have to score much more. So, um, this is going to be – this national championship is going to be very interesting. And shout-out to our resident uh, Alabama fan, Tobias Bixby, who, you know, he, he's – He's he's the most arrogant Alabama fan you're gonna find until they get challenged a little bit, and then you know he starts to starts to be a little quiet, you know, and in the chat it got a little quiet for a while. But shout out to him for uh, another appearance in the national title game. So let's let's get your picks before we get out of here on these New Year's Day bowls. Uh, let's start with the Outback Bowl, which is going to be played at noon. And that's Iowa versus Mississippi State. Give me Mississippi State. Uh, I feel like the defense is going to take over Iowa with overtime. Montez Sweat is really good. Really good. Okay. Um, the Citrus Bowl, uh, which will be played at 1 p.m., uh, Penn State versus Kentucky. Uh, this is McSo- Trace McSorley's swan song. Last time we'll see him in college football. Uh, I think this will this is going to be a fun one. It's Trace McSorley versus Josh Allen. Who wins? Give me Penn State. All right, then we got the Fiesta Bowl kicking off at the same time, 1 p.m. Central Florida versus LSU. Uh, this one's gonna. This one has a, has a lot uh, to do with next year. Um, LSU's not. LSU's down. Greedy Williams. That's gonna hurt, but. I don't think it'll matter too much. Uh, UCF, you don't want any any part of this. And after you lose, please shut up for the for a long, long time and just go away. <laughs> All right, and we got I'm, the Rose I'm, like, Bowl. I'm an LSU fan. Oh, so this week. LSU I'm an LSU fan. Yeah, yeah, can't stand UCF and all this national <laughs> title talk. All right, we got the Rose Bowl, uh, which will kick off at 5 p.m. Eastern time. And that's Washington versus Ohio State. Um, give me Ohio State. This is Urban Meyer's last game. By the way, before Manny Diaz was hired, I actually put out a tweet saying I'd make a deal with the devil and ask my and have Urban Meyer come back for five years, give me two national titles and and maybe three conference titles, and I'll deal with the sanctions later. Just saying. All right, uh, Sugar Bowl, last of the New Year's Day bowls. Uh, That'll be played at 8.45 p.m., Um, Georgia versus Texas. We talked about this a little bit earlier because cornerback DeAndre Baker won't be Mm -hmm. suiting up for this one, but we got Georgia versus Texas, 8.45 p.m. Uh, I actually wanted to pull the upset, but I can't pull the trigger on this one. Give me Georgia. I just think this is going to be way too much. They're going to be pissed that they lost against – against Alabama, and they know they should have been in this playoff, especially with the blowouts that happened with some Oklahoma and Notre Dame. They're going to make a statement. All right, and like we said, we will be back to you guys with another episode for the national championship. But before we before we go out, just give me your preliminary thoughts on, you know, the, the big game that will be played on January 7th at Levi Stadium in Santa Clara, California. Once again – we meet again, old friend, Alabama versus Clemson. Just, you know, some brief preliminary thoughts. And, and like I said, we're going to get deep into the into the situation um, on our next episode. What's your prelims? Uh, this one's going to be closer than probably the last two. Uh, simply put, wow. I think this is the best Clemson team that we've seen, even with the, because even with Deshaun Watson. Um, the first two times, you didn't have the defensive line and the defense that you have for Clemson right now. And they're not just – the defensive line gets all the credit, but they're they're pretty good on every all three levels. They can match Alabama athlete for athlete. 
So I think there Trevor Lawrence is gonna be he he better buckle up his train strap because he may be in a in a Deshaun Watson type situation where he can decide a game. So we'll get deeper into this thing later on the next episode. But this one's gonna be all right, this and I can't wait. <laughs> so I'm sure the listeners can't wait because I wanna I wanna pick Fred's brain and, and definitely get deeper into some of the reasons that he think this one could actually end up being the best. Of the series, we I guess we can go ahead and call it a series now. Um, because yeah, we're at four now. We're at Alabama the... Clemson four. <laughs> right, right. So we got ourselves a nice series going on here. So we will come back to you with in-depth thoughts about the series. But look, everybody, uh, enjoy your New Year's Day Bowl. Uh, happy New Year to everybody out there again. From all of us here at Quick Slants and all of us here at War Room Sports as well, um, for my partner, Fred Perdue, I'm Devin McMillan. Like we always tell you guys, don't accept mediocrity. Dead fast in the war against ignorance. And we'll see you chumps on top. Peace. War Room Sports, www.warroomsports.com. What? Ain't no more to it. <laughs>